whilst Donald Trump was doing this. Got no muscle. We need a little muscle. Then they bring in another one. But he's got a weak face. He looks weak. Now these guys have the whole package. A group of mental health professionals were doing this. He meets criteria for, uh, for narcissistic personality disorder, which is kind of obvious. Um, meets criteria, d- diagnostic criteria for the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Manual for Antisocial Personality Disorder. Meets criteria for psychopathic personality disorder, which is a little bit different from antisocial. Gets more at the things like the lack of remorse and the internal psychological traits that are involved, meets criteria for paranoid personality disorder. And that's not even getting into the delusional disorders that a couple of people uh, mentioned, including grandiose and paranoid delusions. Yes, on Friday, September 27, an expert group of 18 non-partisan experts representing psychiatry, law, political science, economics, history, journalism, climate and nuclear science gathered at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for a conference entitled The More Dangerous State of the World and the Need for Fit Leadership, subtitled The Much More Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. This is the second time the group has met to share their concerns. The first was just ahead of the 2020 election. Their analysis of the dangers of a future Trump presidency was terrifying. The takeaway is that this is not a drill. It's a national emergency. There is consensus that Trump is a threat not only to democracy, but also a national security threat to the world. Again, this is not a political position. It's a medical one. But the event itself and the findings of its panel and their analysis of the threat has been censored by the corporate media. Ask yourself why not a single news organisation has covered this important conference or its recommendations. Donald Trump turned the world upside down. The conflict we see not just politically across the United States, but in Ukraine and Gaza, Iran and Lebanon, can be attributed to his presidency. We can see that legal methods have failed to stop him, political approaches have failed, and military means have not been able to prevent the dangerousness of Donald Trump. Left unchecked, Trump continues to run his mouth, knocking the world off its axis. This is the first of two videos bringing you highlights of the World Mental Health Coalition's conference and its findings, starting with General and Dr Stephen Zanakis, retired Brigadier General and Medical Corps Officer of the United States Army. Our work as military physicians, we were called on frequently. It was uh, fundamental to our practice that we would do evaluations for fitness for duty. We had to respond to our request of our leaders to say, is this person, should this person be cleared here, have a security clearance? Uh, Can this person be put back into the cockpit? Should this surgeon go into the OR? Should this, we have what we call the nuclear assurity program. Should this person have access to nuclear weapons? Now that was the call of the leader. That was the decision of the commander to make, to decide what, who was going to be assigned where, what their responsibilities were, and what authority they were going to have. Our position, my position as a physician, was to evaluate, to advise that leader about what I knew about that person's health and their mental health, and to see if there was an ascertained, if there was a problem in the way that uh, that that person was currently experiencing that may interfere with executing those duties. And you heard a very elegant statement from Admiral Smith about what it takes to have a senior leader. The interesting problem that we have is that uh, we have, uh, that our Congress has been AWOL on taking uh, the one step that they could take to best decide, at least start to explore what those criteria could be for what a president should, in fact, Uh, show and demonstrate to be effective. And that's because they have not taken on being able to further specify and define Section 4 of the 25th Amendment. Uh, Paul Sommergrad, a former president of the APA, and I wrote about this in 2018. 
uh, we said very clearly uh, that this was something that was extremely important as we looked out. I mean, we've had a number of presidents, presidents that have had, that have really already, we know, have had health problems. It doesn't take a lot of imagination, really, to say, at what point in time are we going to have an individual as commander-in-chief who has some problem that clearly is impairing their capacity to function? And who is going to be able to discern that? Well, of course, it's the immediate advisors. It's the people around that, that leader who say, you know, he doesn't track. He doesn't understand what's going on. He's not inquisitive. Frankly, as it was with the case that people felt about Richard Nixon, he doesn't show the character. He doesn't have the, intemper the temperament. He doesn't have the integrity. Those people need to speak up. And when they speak up, that goes to the Congress, and the Congress goes through the process of the 25th Amendment. Well, we have a completely dysfunctional AWOL Congress. So where does the power lie then? Who do we as military physicians have to speak to? As you've heard, truth to power. That's our role. My job many, many times as an Army doctor was to say what nobody else wanted to hear to go in and say, this person can't do his job. This is going to be dangerous. We've got to do some. Well, you know, Steve, uh, you know, if I say this person's got a mental health problem, that's stigmatizing. You've got to tell me more. And that was my job. And by the way, that's different to say about fitness of, uh, to duty then, in fact, what my, many of my colleagues feel that we circle around diagnosis. It's not about that. It's really about, does this person have the skill sets? They're like an artist or an athlete. Do they have the capabilities to do the job that they're being asked to do? I believe we need to be able to make sure that we make, state that clearly to our public, because the people who need to understand that, if our country's going to go in the right direction, if we're going to be able to save our country, are those young people sitting on the couch who may not want to vote, who have decided to abdicate their roles and, and responsibilities, in my view, their responsibilities as, as, as citizens, or the swing voters? This is something that most people is, is beyond their usual scope of their work and their daily lives. Because most of us function in a very clear way. We know what's best for us. We're now saying, no, this is broader. So we have the issue of fitness for duty, and I think it is different than a diagnosis. I think it's also different than what many of my colleagues do is a forensic evaluation. That's, you've seen that, you've probably seen it on television. You know, is this person insane? Are they competent? Those are different evaluations, and I've done a lot of those over the many years. This is a very, this is specifically about can this person do his job? Now, the second is dangerousness. How do we see the issue of dangerousness, uh, which we also have to make a judgment about? And to tell and make explain that this person that we know that we're going to elect we have a reasonable suspicion and maybe conviction that this person is dangerous. The interesting thing that we have is there, were, there was a circle around President Trump who at times will come and speak and tell the stories about what it was like working with him, about how fit he was and how capable he was in that, in the, in that position. And a, the particular one that stands out is a book by John Bolton, where he's, and uh, so the room where it happened, his, his White House memoir. And uh, he, he talks about, uh, this is, this, he calls or says that the president has sy systematically governed with single-minded instinct for looking at issues entirely through the prism of what is good for him and not what is good for the country. And others advisors have said the same thing, but I think they've made a fatal error. 
at least one, how hard it is to work with such extreme characters, with such autocrats, with such despots, because these people, unfortunately, have a kind of genius about what they do. They cannot be controlled. They can't be managed or outmaneuvered, and he was not. So any game played on their field gives them an advantage. This is really worrisome. And the science of psychology, the science of mental health tells us what the character is like of autocrats and despots and how they succeed. That we know and that we can talk about and that is who, what we should be educating folks about. Um, we know that these people see the world through their out, outsized lens. We know that they feel no restraints in terms of exercising power. We know that they are willing to hurt someone else. They're com complete, almost impersonal. Everyone is an object. Everyone is there to be used. We know that. And so we are obligated to say it, to explain it, and that it is dangerous. What's the maximum? See something, say something. And that's what I think is what we're obligated to do going forward. There's one more factor here that we have to take into account. And this is a time to maybe hoist on the man on his own petard. Donald Trump, if elected, and however messy this election would likely be, is going to be 78 years and 220 days old, the oldest person to ever be inaugurated in the office. We've already seen plenty of signs of cognitive decline. We know how this plays out. Any one of us who have taken care of family or been around others and watched that process, we know what that mentality is like. We've listened to him. We've had people say that this is not one of the people who presented, men who presented, uh, played him for debate preparation in 2016 and 2020. This is not the same person who I was studying to prepare for the debates. The rambling, the looseness, the failure to grasp details, the failure to be able to talk through issues. This is not the same person. So it is completely expectable that we will see a serious decline if this man is elected through the four years of his office. That should worry everybody. That should worry us all. And it needs to be said. I mean, it was clearly the story, and it, and in, and it ended up with President Biden deciding to, not to run anymore. There's a lesson learned from that. And we need to take that lesson and make sure that that's also communicated. So with my fellow military officers and senior leaders, uh, and all of you, I mean, we share our pledge. As officers, we take the oath to the Constitution to defend the country. This is what we think is right. It is our country and what we put it as a priority. And I think it is up to us to speak truth to power the power rests with the American people, and to give them the knowledge and the tools so that they feel that they can independently and effectively make the right decision. And that's what we're here to do, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak up about it. I've written four books, and I wrote this one five years ago, The Cult of Trump, and people were not ready to understand that brainwashing and mind control is real. And Members of the panel said, how is this possible? My, my subjective experience, plus 48 years of helping people get out of cults, says this is a dissociative disorder. This is 300.15 in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association that names cults and brainwashing. And there's mental health professionals are not taught about this disorder or how, what can be done to help people recover. This is a public health emergency. We need to preventively educate everyone about what, 
how to tell the difference between ethical influence and unethical influence. This is called the influence continuum. It's part of my doctoral dissertation. It's on my website, freedomofmind.com. And people need to have psychoeducation. We need preventive education. We need to train people how to do interventions with people who have been brainwashed. People are asking, what do we do after? No matter what happens, whether Trump gets elected, we need a massive psychoeducational effort. And we need recovery. We need to make it OK to say, I was in that cult. And I've been trying to model that. We do need to think about what happens after the election, because we have to depolarize our country. And the only way to do it is for people who have loved ones who've been radicalized into MAGA to understand these folks have been brainwashed, but there's a way out. And people are waking up and leaving and talking out. There's a group called um, Leaving MAGA. We need to create an off-ramp to destigmatize we need to stop calling people morons and idiots who are in a cult and speak to them, build common ground, and ask them good questions that make them think. But the critical thing is that if you attack the leader, the doctrine, or the policy head on and try to argue facts, it activates the cult identity to get defensive. They feel persecuted. It's an, it's an ill-advised strategy. How can I know if I've been brainwashed? And step one is disconnect from all of your sources of influence. Take a time out. Go in the woods. Don't be on your frickin' phone eight hours a day, constantly getting digital indoctrination with AI and social media. We respond to love, kindness, compassion. <laughs> We need, we need to reach out to people we know. That's the first step. It can't be done on, on, on public media. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And believe me, people are having doubts. They may not tell you, but they're having doubts. And there is hope. Legal methods have failed. Political approaches have failed. And military means have not been able to prevent the many dangers that we have encountered. And so I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, what message they would like to give to the public, um, because that seems to be our last recourse. And it is time to sit at the table, look across the table, eyeball to eyeball, to your family members and to your friends, and to speak the truth to them at what you're hearing here today about the risks that are involved and the threat to our democracy. And it is also important to look at Project 2025, because this is not one man alone who is running for the presidency. It is a cabal of individuals who only have their own self-interest at heart. They do not care about the American people. And that has been evidenced by what is already taking place. The dictatorship has begun. When you tell a woman what she can and cannot do with her body, that is a dictatorship. When you tell schools what books they can and cannot have available to read in their libraries, that is a dictatorship. When you make it very clear that you have no interest in maintaining the laws that already exist for same-sex marriage, that is a dictatorship. So there is much that can be dismantled beyond national security that will affect each and every one of us throughout the United States and throughout the world. Because the President of the United States is perceived as the guardian of the free world. Do you want to return to a period of vengeful impulsiveness and total chaos that is not only a threat to our national security abroad, but it's a threat to our personal freedoms at home? Or do you want to vote for an individual who does have the judgment, does have the temperament, and does have the integrity to be a fully qualified and completely capable commander in chief on day one? Those are the choices, and the future of our country truly is at stake.
I think it's un understandable in some ways who the Trump voters are. They're basically white, male, um, uh, less educated, high school or less education. But in others, there are people who feel they have lost relative <laughs> status because of the uh, in increased democratization that occurred in, in America when, with the civil rights legislation, blacks increased in their status, segregation was outlawed, and uh, uh, disenfranchisement was outlawed, and so forth. And the increased status that women have had with the uh, women's movement. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of uh, white males have felt they had lost uh, relative superiority and relative status. And Trump comes along and says, uh, I will restore, I'll make America great again, which is an appeal to go back to the past before all these civil rights laws and, and the uh, uh, changes to undo all the various forms of uh, misogyny and sexism and homophobia and so forth. Um, so I think that if we're going to understand the psychology involved, I think that's true. And uh, finally, I totally agree. It's uh, the worst thing we can do is refer to the Trump uh, voters as deplorables. Uh, I think we have to recognize they're, they're basically the same as the rest of us. They're as intelligent. Uh, they're, they're very, you know, they're, they're not psychopaths uh, uh, inherently. Uh, they're just following a psychopath. And... Uh, so it, we have to find a way to be, uh, I think, understanding and generous and, and, uh, uh, and, and treat people with respect, even when we think they're making great mistakes and really harming themselves as well as other people. When you tell people they're in danger, they tend to, it tends to mobilize in some people more their paranoid core. And the more we're aware of the fact that Danger can be constructed, and you know we can attack all of uh, Trump's personality disorders, but the fact is that he appeals to people, and we have to understand it, not in a kind way, but in a technical way that there is more paranoia in the population than is acknowledged, and he can mobilize it, and we don't know how far it will continue to hold against a black woman who presents herself as entirely reasonable, speaking to their needs, and will it overcome people's fear that they are going to be displaced by people of color, that they are going to lose their prestige and their dominance. So I think we have to not be so respectful of people who follow Trump, but we have to understand that they're in the throes of paranoid mechanisms. You can read more about the conference at dangerouscase.org and join me for the weekend show every Sunday as I continue my conversations with Dr. Bandy Lee about the dangerous threat to democracy that Donald Trump poses. I'm Anthony Davis. You can find me on the 5 Minute News YouTube channel and podcast on Wednesdays co-hosting Uncovered and on Sunday on The Weekend Show with Midas Touch.